introduce now our final speaker, Dr. Diana Kenny. When I gave evidence with my friend Helen in 2020 to the parliamentary committee that was looking at the born in the wrong body legislation, and we knew that nothing that we had to say would avert the outcome, a number of people gave presentations. The one that was the most impressive, the one when you could have heard a pin drop in the room, came from Dr. Diana Kenny. Diana, I almost said Diana's a champion, weightlifter. <laughs> Diana's not a champion weightlifter. She's a former professor of psychology at the University of Sydney. She's now a consulting psychologist, psychotherapist, mediator, family dispute resolution practitioner, expert reviewer, report writer, supervisor, researcher, and author. Diana has had extensive experience working with gender questioning young people and their families. It gives me huge pride to introduce Diana. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm described on trans websites as a member of the lunatic fringe, so I think I'm in good company here today. <laughs> so in this brief presentation, I'd like to give you a flavour of the complexity entailed in working clinically with young people with gender identity issues. I will begin with enumerating the dimensions that must be addressed in therapy. I will then illustrate some of these dimensions with case studies from my own practice that demonstrate the varied presentations and personalised requirements for ethical care of these young people and their families. My clinical work has convinced me that young people are almost never ready to self-identify as trans. So there are basically four distinct groups of self-identifiers. The first are what we call early onset uh, transgender young people, and these used to be young preschool boys, um, and that's historically where the majority of transgender people came from, very young boys, and they tend to be persisters. They're very, very rare. I've never had a case um, referred to me. The second group are the ones that I'm most concerned about and I think most of us are most concerned about and that's the adolescent onset, sometimes called ROGD, rapid onset gender dysphoria. This is a very recent phenomenon and I've written extensively on the possibility that social contagion is at work but I've been completely um, vilified for this opinion because if social contagion is the cause of this um, incredible surge of rapid onset gender dysphoria in adolescents, the pillars of gender ideology collapse. Um, and that's why they deny regret, they de deny detransition. Even though on one website, the subreddit website, there are now 57,000 young people who have detransitioned. But it's all a lie as far as the transgender lobby is concerned. So the third group are the over 18s and young adults. Unlike the bias towards females um, in ROGD referrals, the over 18s referred to my practice are more equally distributed between males and females. The majority are referred by parents, even though they are really adults, so most of them don't come of their own accord. Their management is complicated by the fact that they are legally adults and are able to make their own decisions and independently of their parents. And the fourth group are the mature.
mature aged adults and probably one of the, the best examples of that would be someone called Scott Nugent, which you've probably all heard about, who transitioned in his late 30s and regrets it, um, recognising finally that he was in fact a lesbian after having been married for 20 years and fathered three children, um, or mothered three children. Um, yes, so he um, is living with horrific consequences of, of transgendering. So many present in this category after the breakdown of their marriages with a history of long-term cross-dressing and fantasies about being the other sex. Others present as single adults who have been socially transitioned for many years, having first identified as butch lesbians and decide to finalise their transition surgically. So this is a very, very complex uh, area of clinical practice and it's very important um, in the intake assessment to find out what young people don't know about themselves because they are extremely strident in their belief that they are trans and that um, transitioning is going to fix everything, all of the problems of their lives and um, there is no point arguing with them directly about the fact that they are right and um, anyone who tells them otherwise are idiots, including me. Um, so I don't tell them that they're wrong. But I say, we've heard this term, exploratory psychotherapy. And it's, it's the provision of a safe space for these young people to really look at their lives in a way that they haven't done before. So the first thing we have to look at is their family constellation. Um, is their family conflict and dysfunction? And what are the marital and dynamics? I've worked with more than maybe 50 or 60 young people in long-term psychotherapy as of this date. And I can say almost categorically that I didn't see one functional marriage amongst this group of young people. Then we have to do a psychological evaluation, and it includes, you know, the old chestnuts of ADHD, ADD, autism spectrum. Are they self-harming? Are they suicidal? Um, do are they engaging in non-suicidal self-injury? Um, do they have anxiety, depression, incipient borderline personality disorder, um, possibly um, psychoses of some kind? and ACEs, which are the adverse childhood events that involve trauma. How many of them have had a history of body dysmorphia and or eating disorders? What has their school experience been like? Um, what is their attitude to school? Are they interested in study? Are they doing well academically? Have they experienced peer rejection, bullying? Have they truanted? Um, and what are their post-school aspirations. One of the most important and neglected areas is looking at their cognitive style. And by that, I assess the degree to which they are cognitively immature. Are they concrete thinkers? Are they cognitively rigid? And do they engage in cognitive distortions? The majority of young people who come to me aged around um, 11, 12 to up to 15 are cognitively immature. And this is why putting um, them in the front seat of self-identification and declaring themselves transgender is a completely wrong-headed approach um, to this issue. Um, they lack the understanding or they misunderstand gender ideology. They've just swallowed it whole without examining its precepts or the illogicality of its basic tenets. And um, they cannot argue uh, from a logical perspective or a mature perspective. They can feed you everything that they've read on the internet um, and they can give it back to you verbatim. But that is not being an independent thinker. Um, so the next thing that I assess is to what degree do they understand the gravity and irreversibility 
of medical and surgical transition. Um, and what gender affirming treatment actually entails and the consequences of that treatment. For example, infertility, sexual dysfunction, complications of cross-sex hormones and surgery, and lifelong patienthood. What have their sexual experience been like? Have they had any sexual experience to know for absolutely sure that they don't care about sex? Which is what every single one of them tell me. They're not interested in that stuff. Um, but when I explore the extent of their sexual relationships, even in the older adolescent age group, 16 to 18, they've had virtually no sexual experience. The majority have not had sexual abuse experiences. Um, but their sexual knowledge and their sexual activity is minimal and one would expect it to be at this young age. Um, there's not promiscuity in this group, um, which is, is, is interesting. Then we look at social cognition and um, by that I mean the influence of the ecological systems that they're operating in for schools, have they been to gender clinics? Um, how much have they accessed on the internet? And how embedded are they in the online transgender communities? I then talk to them about their perceptions and misperceptions of gender roles. And finally, um, examine the systemic function of the rapid onset group. Um, and this entails underlying dynamics such as defiance of parents, um, finding an in-group because they've um, often experienced isolation and marginalisation in their own peer groups, actually being seen, being heroic, feeling heroic, denying development of their sex bodies, a fear of adulthood and a fear of sexual relationships. These are a lot, some of the underlying dynamics that are never mentioned in any transgender literature that you're likely to read. A very big issue in this group is to assess um, the self-harm and suicidality because this is a flagship of the trans lobby. Better to have a, a live son than a dead daughter and vice versa. If you don't let this child transition, they're going to kill themselves. This is what's said to parents in gender clinics. And so the parents are put into a terrible bind about allowing their child to destroy their own bodies for life or fearing that their child will no longer be walking the planet if they're not allowed to do it. It's a terrible choice for parents. So my conceptualisation, and I stress this is my own conceptualisation that has not been proved empirically or anything like that, it's based on my clinical experience. But I have come to the conclusion that for most young people who want to transition, there is a vulnerable, traumatised part of the self that is hated. So it is subsumed into the competent self, which is the part that suppresses all doubts and anxiety and presses for gender transition. If the traumatised self pushes for recognition of his psychic pain, the young person may resort to self-harm and suicidal ideation, which is a form of acting out of their self-hatred against their own bodies and selves. Affirming cl clinicians collude with the patient's own attacks on the traumatised self by traumatising their bodies with cross-sex hormones and mutilating surgery. They hope the transition will restore the young person to an <coughs> ideal state. Medics become omnipotent creators of this ideal state. When this fails, the patient sinks into further self-hatred, which is enacted through self-harming and suicidal states. I might add that um, a very important paper by um, Michael Biggs from the UK examined the su actual suicide rates in transgender young people and he found the rate was 4 in 15,000. So it's kind of a cry of wolf from, from the trans lobby that this is the reason you must trans 
transition your child now, or this is the reason you must put them on puberty blockers. Um, we have to save them, you know, from a fate um, worse than death. So what are the mechanisms of social contagion? Because this is the position that I'm taking on why we're seeing um, a 4,000% increase in young people declaring themselves transgender. That figure comes from the United Kingdom. So peer contagion is a very powerful socialising force on children and it begins in the preschool years. By middle childhood, gender is the most important factor in the formation of peer associations, highlighting the significance of gender as an organising principle of the norms and values associated with gender identity. The rapid onset group have often experienced peer rejection, bullying, hostility and or social isolation and hence feel marginalised from peer groups. They will gravitate to the rainbow clubs. The rainbow clubs in schools where everyone is accepted without question, especially if they declare that they're an alternative gender, whereupon they are lauded and validated, even when they had no previous intention to do so. So social contagion is a very powerful phenomenon underlying the staggering increases in primarily adolescent girls declaring themselves transgender. Social contagion is identified as a mechanism in eating disorders, self-harm and suicide, substance abuse and emotion transmission and now its role in gender dysphoria can no longer be denied. Another mechanism of social contagion is deviancy training and this is where deviant attitudes and behaviours are rewarded by a peer group um, and if you engage in those um, uh, behaviours then you've got this um, subgroup, outgroup of which you are now an important member. So you become an outcast to become a member of an in-group. And the third main mechanism is something we call co-rumination. And this is a process of repetitive discussion, rehearsal and speculation about a problematic issue within the peer diet. And this is often a way that the transmission of suicide occurs in clusters in um, adolescent young people. It results in increases in internalising disorders such as um, anxiety and depression and gender confusion. And we know from studies outside of the gender dysphoria literature that ad young adolescent females are most affected. So I want to give you an example from my practice of the cognitive rigidity that occurs in these young people. Um, so, um, and most of these arise from what's happening in the family constellation and the messages that are sometimes communicated inadvertently by parents to their children. So the first example was a boy who had a special needs younger sister who got all the attention. Watching his mother tend to his sister one day, he said, Mummy, you will only love me if I am a girl thereupon declaring himself transgender. A loved father appears to love her brother more than his daughter and spends much more time engaged in male pursuits with his son. She says, I want to be close to dad, but he spends all his time with my brother and never with me. She concluded it's better to be a boy and declared herself transgender. Now she is in a perpetual rage that her father does not accept her transgender identity because she feels she has nothing more to offer him. A third case. A mother tells her pre-adolescent daughter, who was described as a tomboy, about the sexual abuse she experienced as a child by her stepfather and the sexual assault she endured as a teenager. Her daughter formed the view that girls are unsafe in the company of men and are constantly at risk of harm particularly as they approach puberty. 
She decided that being female sucked, in her words, and that she would prefer to be a male in order to keep herself safe and strong. A 15-year-old girl has a mother who has been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. She's lived with her mother's emotional storms and capriciousness all her life. When she has an outburst, her father says, you have your mother's BPD and I don't want to have to deal with that again. He would then leave the house. Her father told her, it's because you were the firstborn. The firstborn girl in mum's family always got the worst mental illness. This girl formed the view that men and boys are saner than women and girls and that it would be preferable to change gender rather than turn out like her mother. I've got plenty more, but I just thought these are salient examples of how these young people are thinking because we don't hear about this kind of detail in the media, we don't hear about it in the trans lobby literature. So family constellation is incredibly important in these young people. Identity is not hardwired. It develops in a social world where the young person experiences attachments, trauma, abuse, or misperceives the meaning of experiences because of cognitive maturity or concrete thinking, which are attempts to solve the problems of their current lives. So we need to explore in detail their identifications, that is, who I want to be like, but also their disidentifications, who I don't want to be like. So I, I'm just going to give you um, an example um, of a young boy, a 14-year-old natal boy, um, to show you that gender identity is very, very far from fixed as soon as the child self-identifies as trans or declares himself transgender. So this 14-year-old Nathan boy first came out to his parents as gay. And um, his parents were modern parents and they were very accepting. They said, that's fine, you'll have a happy life and um, if that's um, the kind of life that you're going to be leading, then we are very supportive. So everything was good up until that point. Then he soon changed his declaration to bisexual when he experienced a powerful crush on a female classmate. After she rejected him, he was heartbroken and he came out as trans and demanded puberty blockade and cross-sex hormones immediately. In therapy, his demands for transition were strident and incessant. He constantly asked me when I was going to tell his parents that he could go ahead with his transition. His parents had put me in the very difficult position of saying I have to wait for the report from your gender therapist before we make a decision. So of course I had to stretch out this therapy for as long as I possibly could until you know, we could work through some of the issues. But he went ahead and shaved his legs, um, his arms and his body hair. He grew his hair long and he started to wear eye makeup and nail polish. He ordered female clothing from the internet and wore it secretly in his room. When his parents confiscated these clothing items, his female friends at school lent him their clothes to, work, to wear until I advised his parents to put a stop to this. Teachers at his school started calling him by his preferred name and pronouns until I advised his parents not to allow this. Several months after therapy commenced, while still vehemently protesting his trans female identity, he wrote a letter to his parents apologising for misleading them. He said he now realised that he was not a trans female, but a demigirl, denoting partial non-binary and partial female gender identity. He was very schooled in all the lingo. He changed this orientation shortly thereafter to Demi Boy, before again writing to his parents, telling them that he was only joking about the whole thing and that they were the only people who had taken his joke seriously. I advised his parents to eat humble pie and give their son the opportunity to exit the gender maze without losing face. 
so they said nothing. The next day, he asked his parents to take him for a haircut and declared himself male and straight. So this all occurred over an 11-month therapy. So this is just one indicative tale of how many young people are confused about their sexual orientation and often conflate sexual orientation with gender identity. So the majority of young gender dysphoric adolescents have had no sexual experience other than crushes from a long distance, hand-holding and perhaps kissing. They have an absolute disdain of sex as gross and declare themselves pan in compensation. They are indifferent to the loss of sexual function and fertility. They don't care about sex and if they want children they'll adopt. Standard answer. And they're confused about the nature of trans relationships. So for example, a self-declared non-binary male, natal sex male, in a relationship with a transgender declaring natal female, that is, a trans man, told their parents they were in a gay male relationship. Similarly, two natal females, both trans men, prior, no, no transition had occurred as yet, rejected the suggestion that they were a lesbian couple and stated that they were a gay male couple. Now, internalised homophobia is unfortunately on the rise, as most of you who are in, engaged with LGB issues would know that it's not cool to be gay anymore. Um, so if an adolescent realises that they're same-sex attracted, they find this unacceptable due to parental or internalised homophobia, and the adolescent reasoning goes as follows. Being same-sex attracted is bad and shameful. My parents will reject me if I'm gay. If I'm a boy attracted to other boys, I must be a girl and therefore need to transition so that my attraction to boys becomes heterosexual. That is their reasoning. And I'll just give you one example. Artem, aged 15, from a Middle Eastern country that is homophobic was referred by his mother for a range of issues, but specifically because he had declared himself transgender. He was post-pubertal, facially and bodily hirsute with a very deep male voice. Artem was insistent that he was transgender and was impatient to commence his social transition and to obtain prescriptions for cross-sex hormones. This is how Artem described himself. I see myself as bisexual. I have feelings for guys and girls, more like a pan thing. I've had a boyfriend who identifies as male and pan since last year. We get together, just the two of us. We visit each other's houses. I guess it would be okay with being gay. For me, it fluctuates. So he's recognising his innate gayness, but it fluctuates because of what his parents say and think. So of his mother, Artem said, Mum knows I have this friend. She doesn't know that he is my boyfriend. I don't think Mum will take it well because she asks me if I still like girls. She wouldn't take kindly to knowing I'm gay and have a boyfriend. When asked to describe his father, he said, Dad is trying to suppress his queer phobia, but he says bad things about LGB. He's anti it all. He got angry with me for refuting what he was saying. Dad said gay is about anal sex, and that is gross. Then Mum told him to shut up, and I went to my room and cried. Dad is anti-queer for sure. He tries to suppress it because he still loves me. I felt very disappointed in Dad when he expressed these sentiments. He will be very freaked out if he thinks I am queer, gay or trans. So, in conclusion, 
it is imperative to keep the developmental path open into adulthood. Young people need frontal lobe maturation that occurs only in their early 20s and is not complete until about 25 years of age so that young people can come to know themselves. They should not be pressured into self-identification at the age of 12 or 13. Psychological trauma from the past forms part of their psychic structure in the present. The expression of these traumas is socio-culturally embedded, that is, Social contagion permits particular forms of acting out of these traumas. And in this era of adolescence, the acceptable form is to declare yourself trans, not gay. Envy and rivalry are part of the human condition, and unconscious envy is a factor in trans identification. Gender dysphoric adolescents need assistance to explore their defences and internal psychic conflicts and manage their psychic pain before irreparably altering their bodies. As Evans and Evans said, the body is used to act out something that cannot be accepted or processed by the mind. Clinicians should not collude with the fantasy that the embodied self can be altered or removed. Thank you.